um, uh, to many, many different types of people. Uh, when Caroline invited me some time ago to, to give this talk, I was pressed for a title. And because it was far off, I thought, ah, here's a grandiose title, you know, from neuroscientific theories to effective practice in the classroom. It'll bring in the crowds. It's tantalizing. But of course, it raises the problem of, well, how do you do this? What does it mean? You know, how do we get started with trying to go from basic scientific theory to practice in the classroom? Um, it's a very hard problem. The first thing is actually to find the relevant question. There's so many different questions out there, um, relevant to educational practice. How do, I how do we identify one that is um, doable uh, and that is meaningful um, and that, that is important? Because we can't answer every question that's out there as well. And once we have our question, how do we find the relevant science from the millions of pieces of science that are more or less related to the question, or at least that we believe are more or less related to the question we want answered, how do we select the right ones? And many of those pieces of scientific evidence are actually uh, arrived at or obtained in highly artificial constrained contexts that bear very little resemblance to what is actually happening in the classroom. So these problems of selecting the question and selecting the science really require profound interactions between the basic scientists and educational pract um, practitioners. And this is exactly the role that Learnis has in mind um, and is really uh, what we think is foundational to pushing forward advances in education through the advances um, of uh, scientific discoveries. So let me tell you a story. I'm going to tell you that story by illustrating the process by which we uh, went from theory to practice using one example, the example of the unlock intervention trial. So this is a trial that, uh, sorry, this is an intervention that uh, tries to improve scientific and maths reasoning in primary school children and which is based on um, uh, clear cognitive neuroscience evidence. Uh, along the way, I'll signpost all of the interactions we had with practitioners and developers and so forth to show how that dialogue is really essential to the process as well. So where did it start from? Well, this project started when the Education Endowment Foundation and the Wellcome Trust got together and decided that of all the uh, in, um, improvements and all the discoveries we'd made in the last 50 years of cognitive neuroscience, some of this must be directly relevant to uh, learning in the classroom. Um, and in order to make that come to the forefront, they agreed to fund projects, or rather fund intervention trials, uh, for um, uh, projects that had some prior evidence of working on a small scale and that were grounded in clear cognitive neuroscience evidence. Um, as part of that, they funded six large-scale trials. Uh, one of them was on teen sleep. So, uh, you know, moving the start time of classes so that teenagers uh, so that school would be more in sync with the kind of biorhythms the, of, of, of teenagers who really don't like getting up early in the morning. Um, another one was on uh, the role of uh, anaerobic exercise on learning. Um, others uh, looked at familiar concepts of spaced versus mass learning. Do you distribute information or do you uh, teach it in, in short chunk, uh, chunks? Um, they looked at the uh, effects of reward systems and also a uh, particular uh, spelling project or program based on identifying rhymes for children. And we were one of those six projects, uh, and this was the Unlock project, which is about learning counterintuitive uh, concepts. So what does that mean? What is this about? So let me give you some background from science and maths, which really um, pinpoints the particular phenomenon we were trying to uh, intervene on, and that would hopefully improve children's performance in math and science. So let's go back to our science classes. Some of you are scientists, some of you may not be scientists. Um, if I point to some pictures here, what is that thing, right? It's a dolphin, of course it's a dolphin, and we all know it's a fish, right? No, it's not a fish, of course it's a mammal because it breathes air, but it looks like a fish, right? And even as adults, we carry with us these kind of inaccurate lay beliefs um, about the world, uh, which continue and which we have to be able to manage and. Um, I, I hesitate to use the word suppress, but we have to be able to ignore, at least for a short period of time, in order to take on real uh, scientific evidence. Um, other examples of that are you know, the idea that uh, the Earth is going around the Sun when it clearly looks like the Sun is going around us, and it has looked like that for tens of thousands of years, and people you know, for thousands of years believed the Sun was going around us. Um, and um, yeah, there are plenty of examples of this. So. Um, Children bear lots of these, what we call misconceptions, these lay beliefs that are incorrect in terms of the formal scientific um, 
uh, ideas and theories. So before going into school, children have misconceptions about gravity, uh, inertia, balance, for example. When they are at school, and here we're talking about primary school, they continue to have misconceptions about concepts such as life and death, what is alive, what is dead, about temperature versus heat, um, state changes, melting, um, evaporating, and so forth. But even after school, as adults, we continue <coughs> to carry many of these misconceptions with us. Um, misconceptions about gravity, which will be, um, well, sorry, misconceptions about gravity and about uh, electrical circuits, for example, which we'll be focusing on as a particular example. So we have all these lay ideas, um, and somehow, in order to utilize our formal scientific knowledge, our formal scientific training, we have to kind of overcome these ideas that pop into our minds um, all the time. Um, so <clears throat> similar things actually happen in maths as well. So in maths, when we're learning the methods and techniques uh, for carrying out calculations, for understanding concepts and so forth, we're often taught different strategies for arriving at the same thing. So different strategies, for example, for adding two numbers together. Um, and we may also have our own strategies that we developed um, while being given exercises by the teacher and so forth. And evidence suggests that actually children during the period of acquisition are trialing all of these strategies. They're selecting some of them and they eventually end up selecting the ones that are most effective, most efficient. Um, and one question we could ask is how do they actually arrive at which is the appropriate math mathematical strategy for solving a problem? Similarly in science, I've got this lay belief and I've got this kind of uh, formal concept that's being taught by my teacher. How do I select the right one? Okay? And the idea that we want to pursue is the idea that inhibitory control is really what's allowing us to do this. By inhibitory control, what we mean is being able to inhibit um, those ideas or those strategies that are not relevant at the moment, that are not going to give you the right answer. Um, so, is there any evidence that inhibitory control plays a role in performance, academic performance? Well, there's a fair amount of evidence uh, that it does in the domain of mathematics, primary mathematics anyway, uh, and some sec early secondary mathematics as well. So, for example, inhibitory control uh, has been found to be associated with kind of uh, standardized math test performance and magnitude comparisons in preschoolers, um, three to six-year-olds. Um, inhibitory control is uh, associated with kind of procedural math skills and conceptual math knowledge in kind of 11 to 14 year olds and it's also uh, involved in predicting when uh, a 14 year old or young teen will switch strategies to a more effective strategies when solving math problems. So there's a, a quite a lot of evidence in the domain of mathematics that this actually bears out has practical implications in terms of children's achievements and performance in uh, the realm of maths. Before I move on I want to talk about one other uh, aspect of kind of interference that might hinder our uh, kind of taking on of counterintuitive beliefs. And I alluded to that in terms, uh, at the beginning when I was talking about the sun appearing to go over uh, around the earth. Um, we are on a daily basis, we're confronted with perceptual information which seems to conflict with what our teachers are trying to tell us. So the classic example of that in physics is, is if you're trying to teach, or this is geography, but it's physics, I guess, trying to teach a seven-year-old that um, the Earth is flat. I'm sorry, <laughs> there we are, I've made the mistake. Trying to teach a seven-year-old that the Earth is round, uh, um, you know, this seems unbelievable because on a daily basis, they get perceptual reinforcement that the Earth is flat. You know, they go out and play in the playground and it darn well looks flat. And yet, you know, maybe 10 minutes in a whole week, someone is telling them that, that it's round. So somehow they have to be able to um, extract that as being the most important piece of information and the kind of constant perceptual reinforcement about a flat earth is wrong. Similar things exist in mathematics. There are plenty of misconceptions in maths where the perceptual evidence appears to contradict what the formal conclusions are. So for example, in judging which angle is bigger, if we look up here, um, Many individuals will say, well, actually, angle Y is bigger than angle X, when in fact the angles are of equal value, of equal magnitude. It looks bigger because actually the arc on this side, uh, if you uh, measure it, the end of the lines is longer than the arc on the left side as well. Or similarly, some misconceptions are um, that uh, shapes that have bigger perimeters must have bigger areas. 
right now. Uh, this, I've, I've, I work with young children, primary school children in maths, and this is a classic one that's really hard to tell them is wrong. <laughs> um, and of course, it's clearly wrong. So over here, we have an, a shape with a perimeter of 20 centimeters and an area of 16. And here we have a shape of, uh, with an area of 16 and um, a perimeter of 16 centimeters as well. Okay, so we have this constant perceptual information, which in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases turns out to be wrong. So the question is, well, how do we overcome these intuitions, these perceptual biases? And again, it may have something to do with inhibitor control. Being able to inhibit that information, that, that answer that's being driven by the perceptual information in order to select the answer that um, is given by uh, analysis. Um, and finally, here I pointed to math and science um, and, and tried to suggest that inhibitory control played a role in both of these things. But it turns out that math and science have often been studied independently, at least in terms of the role of inhibitory control in these um, domains. So um, we started from this as a kind of educational challenge of how to get children to take on these counterintuitive concepts in math and science. Um, and let go of those kind of more compelling intuitive ones. Um, so this was a challenge from the educational perspective. The question now is to find some science that um, will help us put the pieces of the puzzle together and understand what is going on. Because if we understand what is going on, if we understand what the causal mechanism is that drives behavior, then we can start to intervene and maybe change children's behaviors as well. Um, so some of that science I've already referred to in that there were experimental studies looking at the role of inhibitory control on academic performance. The science that excited us the most, got us uh, interested in this, was really the idea, it was um, some, some new evidence from cognitive neuroscience suggesting that there were actually fundamental differences in the way experts and novices responded, uh, in, in their brains, sorry, responded to these different types of problems. Um, you may have said, uh, remember that I said early on that these misconceptions um, continue well into adulthood. And a study came out in 2014 by Mason et al., which was comparing the brain activations of specialist physics, uh, physicists, in this case they were doing, uh, talking about un third year undergraduate physicists, versus novice um, students of the same age, so humanities um, students of the same age. Um, and what they did is they basically put them in an MRI unit to kind of try to determine what parts of the brain were working hardest when they were solving certain types of questions. Um, and they were given um, photographs, sketches of electrical circuits and asked to say whether this circuit represented a valid instance or a false uh, instance in the world. And I'm not sure how well you can see this, um, but uh, here we've got three different types of circuits. Um, in this one, we have uh, an electrical circuit with a battery that you can't quite see, a battery, and then a, um, a light is on um, and uh, inside that circuit, and then a wire goes off, and that wire is actually being cut right here, and then there's another light that's on. And you're asked, well, is this valid or not? And that's clearly false, because if the wire is cut, you know, there's no way this light should be on, right? Um, down here, uh, we had uh, a, a, a scientific circuit, so you've got a battery, same thing, circuit goes around, light is on, here the wire actually goes straight to the light, but the light stays off. Okay? And this actually turns out to be um, scientifically valid because in order for a light to come on, there has to be a closed circuit. So there would have to be a, a wire that returned back uh, to, to complete a, a um, sorry, if I just said that completely wrong. Sorry, this is correct, <laughs> I should say, yes. This is absolutely correct because <laughs> there, isn't, there is no closed circuit. If there was a closed circuit, the electricity would go through and the light would come on. Since there is no closed circuit, the light is off. So this is, you know, fine. Now here comes a confusing one. Uh, the confusing one is the one that I actually started to explain, uh, showing that these misconceptions still persist, even in people who reason about these problems on a you know, weekly basis. Um, same circuits, uh, we have a battery here, full circuit, the light comes on because there's a full circuit, but now we have a wire, a single wire that goes out to touch this light and the light is on. And this just feels intuitively right. You know, especially if you think of electricity as something like water, where the water is going in this way because you've got a pipe, okay? Um, but it's wrong because in order for the light to come on, there would have to be a closed, um, closed loop. So this is the most challenging problem because you have to overcome your intuition that it, it should be right when in fact it's wrong. And what uh, Mason et al. found is that um, I mean, in these two, when they compared the brain activations of experts versus novices, um, in, in these two domains which just require, these two types of questions which just require knowledge, they found, you know, 
similar types of brain activation, but in particular maybe a little bit more activation in the temporal lobes for the experts. Um, temporal lobes are associated with knowledge and s semantic memory, so that's not surprising. They have more knowledge in this domain. It's activating that part of the brain more. But most importantly, um, what they found is that in the kind of counterintuitive one where you have to suppress this um, thing that feels so right, um, experts actually activated the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the interior cingulate cortex more than um, novices. Why is this important? Because those are parts of the brain that are involved in inhibitory control. So what it was suggesting is that scientists, um, or at least third year physics students, were better at solving these problems because they were better at inhibiting that kind of misconception that we all have. And the conclusion there from this paper is that really improving your ability to inhibit those misconceptions would improve performance on academic tests and so forth. So this was the neuroscience evidence that we took um, to construct a classroom-based intervention that would hopefully help children um, improve their academic performance in math and science tests. Um, you'll note that, of course, this setup of some adults put in an MRI scanner, looking at a screen, pushing a left-right button, is extraordinarily different from what happens in a year three class in a regular primary school. So we're taking a leap of faith that what has been distilled in a pure type of evidence is still going to manifest in some way, some meaningful and useful way within a, a real classroom. So just to summarize, the, the key idea that we're uh, building this intervention on uh, which comes from a problem identified in educational practice and has sought some pieces of solution from scientific practice through um, interactions and collaborations between ourselves and other researchers and educational practitioners um, is something like this. That basically um, we need to uh, be able to, so whenever we're reasoning in math and science, we have higher beliefs um, and uh, direct experience which uh, primes um, answers and solutions to the problems which may not be correct according to scientific theory. And in order to take on those counterintuitive concepts, learn to use those theories appropriately in the right context, we need to learn to inhibit those uh, prior beliefs um, straight off. Okay, so this led, this was the basis for the unlock um, or stop and think. Um, intervention study. So what I'm going to do now is talk you through how we went from these rather nebulous ideas to creating something that could happen, uh, be used effectively in the classroom and would be supported by um, uh, teachers and taken on by teachers and hopefully enjoyed by children and be effective uh, in the end as well. So um, what was the study about. Um, so the UNLOCK project was this intervention study, as I said, which combined cognitive psychology, educational psychology, and cognitive neuroscience literature. In order to develop this um, intervention that I'm going to describe, um, we had an initial 18-month development phase. Um, so this development phase was critical for developing the program that I'm going to describe to you. During this phase, what we did was um, create, first of all, go through existing literature, discuss with teachers uh, what the problems that children had in particular um, conceptual science and math areas, um, and then create characters, create scenarios that were relevant to children of the right age group uh, in order to address these problems. Um, we, we piloted some of these um, uh, procedures. We piloted some of these programs on small sets of schools and classes to kind of identify which ones were actually practicable, which ones were pragmatic and would work in the classroom um, with real people, with all the pressures that real teachers were uh, encountering all the time. Um, so it, what, we, what it was was of course a program um, to uh, an intervention program that would change children to uh, train children, sorry, to use their existing inhibitory control skills in the context of math and science. So we weren't necessarily trying to teach them to have better self-control, better inhibitory control. I mean, that might be good, but that wasn't our main objective. Our main objective was to get the children to understand and realize that now I'm in a math and science context, I should be using those inhibitory control skills. Um, and th again, through this development phase, in uh, discussions with our colleagues and with our educational practitioner colleagues as well, we chose to develop, I'm sorry, to deliver this intervention through a computerized platform, so a computerized learning activity. 
Um, this was an implementation choice and is not necessarily um, kind of a, an essential element of the intervention itself because the science that I reviewed said nothing about whether it should be you know, computer delivered or not computer delivered. Um, so, okay. Um, so, the intervention was called stop and think and the key idea is to do exactly what it says on the tin, stop and think. Right? The idea is to get children to stop uh, and stop from blurting out the first answer that comes into their mind, or writing down the first answer that, that you know, um, is, uh, comes into their mind. So examples of, of people doing that are, are things like, um, if I were to ask you, you know, what do cows drink? Nope, it's not milk. It turns out to be water, right? And even those of you who've heard it many times, this example, okay, still have the word milk that comes to the forefront, because this is uh, highly frequently associated with cows, um, and so you, if you're responding quickly, this is what you want to do. And this is what children often do when it's incorrect. I can give you another example of that. I'm thinking of an animal. It's not a dog. It's, a, it's not actually a cat either, by the way. Uh, um, there are many millions of other animals I could have been thinking of, but you're all thinking cat, right? Because there are associations between cat and dog. Um, again, this is what we're trying to get the children to stop. In order to, to be able to stop, what we want them to do is to take a short breather um, and uh, maybe four seconds before they um, you know, answer. And this allows the alternative answers, the less frequent ones, the less associated uh, ones to, to come to bubble up and come to the forefront. I'll say. So um, stop and think. This was delivered, uh, it was a 10 week intervention. So uh, three times a week, it could be, you know, the teachers could choose, could be Monday, Wednesday, uh, Friday, anytime they wanted. The idea was that these, this little intervention, computerized intervention, would be delivered during the first um, 10 minutes or 12 minutes of a math or science lesson. Um, and each one of these consisted of one math example and one science example. I'm going to step through them in a little while um, so that you can see exactly what we mean. The content was adapted to the year three and year five curriculum in England um, in 2016. Um, so it, you know, the key, as I was saying here, is to make sure all of this was embedded within the experiences that they would have. So embedded within the kind of knowledge base and evaluations and so forth that they would be required um, to partake in. And importantly, uh, we opted for a whole class delivery model. So because this is a computer game and people are interacting with it and answering questions, we could have designed an individual one. So each child sits in front of a computer and goes through this program, and this would have allowed us to um, maybe be slightly more adaptive, maybe uh, move forward more quickly or more slowly for some children, depending on their performance. Um, and this is one of the things that came up during our development phase, that although we had uh, aspired to develop individualized uh, program. For practical reasons, it turned out that the whole class approach was much better. Um, largely because many of the schools didn't have adequate numbers of um, computers or IT facilities that would enable us to um, deliver this effectively. Um, so, you know, the school may have 25 computers, but if there are 28 people in the classroom, what do you do with the extra three? Right? And of course, often in, in, in the real world, when a school says they've got, let's say, 30 computers, um, they've got 10 of them which are the latest model, 10 of them from five years ago, and 10 of them from <laughs> 10 years ago, half of which don't work. So children would be getting completely different um, kind of levels of performance and support uh, through this computer game. So we opted for a whole class delivery in which the class together sat in front of the board, the teacher uh, was the mediator in that she or he would deliver the questions and she or he would select the answer uh, from the whole class. Um, and I've put here on my slides uh, a web address that you can find a short demo of this if you have some time in the future. Okay, so what, what was the uh, computer game like, the stop and think game like? What well, first, it took the format of a game show. So um, children were introduced to various characters um, and... Uh, Sam, um, Sam. Uh, anyway, the, the key character uh, um, would kind of do the narration um, and uh, there were three, three other children who were asked questions. And in, in an initial phase, the class would interact with these children as well. Um, oh yes, I remember, it wasn't Sam, it was Andy. There we are, Andy. 
it's amazing what you suppress when you're, when you're trying to, not to. Um, so Andy would ask questions. For example, Andy might ask a question. They'd be shown these kind of blocks. You have strips and blocks and say, well, what number is in the blocks? And at the, at the beginning, uh, a stop, a hand stop icon would appear. Um, and while this icon was present, the children could not respond in the sense that the, the computer would not respond. So they were forced to wait five seconds before they were able to answer, uh, enter a response. Um, and um, first problem, initial stage, we then return to the game show where various contestants would provide their possible reasoning or answers uh, for, for what answer they would give. Um, and the children then were allowed to discuss among themselves and to select as a class which one might have the right answer and so forth. So they went through a few iterations of this, uh, eventually um, each time being given a little more support if they were getting the answers wrong until eventually they got the answer right. Um, now after that, the class would then enter into a bonus round. Right? Now if you want children to do more, just call it a bonus round. Um, and in this bonus round they had a set of problems uh, uh, around the same theme that they would work through. Um, different classes would work through different numbers of these, um, depending on how quickly they got the concept. Um, but the point here is not that we were delivering the, uh, you know, uh, pedagogical training about this particular problem, but again, we're trying to engage the children in stopping and thinking. Um, so this is an example of how one of the math problems might go uh, unfold, and here I'm just showing an example of a year three science problem where um, children have to click on the items that are alive. Of course, remember, stop and think. So you can't click immediately, <laughs> you'd have to wait your four seconds. Um, and the misconception we're getting at here is that you know, things that are warm and moving are alive. Okay? Well, the fire is very warm, in fact it's hot, and it's also moving, but it's not alive. Um, so this is just to show you an example, and as I said early on, for any particular session, the children would get one math problem for six minutes and one uh, science problem for six minutes as well. Now, in order to evaluate whether um, it was the inhibitory training that was actually improving academic performance in this, our intervention was designed to, uh, with an active control condition as well. Now, you could say, well, we're going to evaluate the children's performance, the children who were playing this stop and think game, against those that had business as usual. Um, and if there's better performance in those that had the computer game versus those that had business as, as usual, then hooray, you know, the, the computer game works. But we don't really know why it works, if that's the case. Because there's lots of evidence suggesting that just knowing that you're in a trial will improve your performance. Okay? Psychology, this is called the Hawthorne effect and medicine's placebo. Um, why is that? Well, who knows? It could be the children try a little bit harder because they know they're being looked at. It could be the teachers are trying a little bit harder. Who knows? But what that means is that as soon as the game is no longer in a trial, it may not actually be effective at all. So to evaluate whether your uh, intervention in this, the stop and think game is actually more effective or is actually effective, you need to compare it to some other active control. An active control is a group of children that are playing some kind of similar computer game but that does not have the magic inhibitory control uh, ingredient here. If then the children who were in the stop and think do better than those, then you could say, ah, um, then we can conclude that it was in fact the inhibitory control training that was providing the uh, advantage in terms of academic performance. So we had an, uh, um, an active control called the C+, and this was really developed by a colleague of ours, Dr. Shweta Meyer, and it was using similar characters, the same characters, similar platform, similar look, 12 minutes uh, in the uh, dosage was the same as for stop and think, but it was delivering elements of the PSHE curriculum um, and getting children to reflect on social health uh, issues and so forth. Uh, okay, um, and uh, after having spent the 10 weeks in the intervention, the children were then evaluated on their uh, academic performance. That was ultimately the, the, uh, the aim of this, to see if there was an improvement in academic performance. And uh, they were evaluated, or rather that was the aim of the uh, Education Endowment Foundation, um, to see whether there was academic <coughs> performance. Um, and uh, in order to evaluate this, uh, we used the GL assessment standardized tests, the progress test in maths or progress test in science. Um, and each of these takes about a year, I'm sorry, a year, takes an hour <laughs> to, uh, to sit. Um, so to avoid too much load on the classrooms, uh, what we did was randomly allocate half the children 
to being evaluated in maths and half the children to being evaluated in science. Although they had the training within the context of math and science, all of them, they were just tested on one or the other at the end. And finally, we also kind of tested their inhibitory control skills just to see whether this had actually improved their inhibitory control. Um, and although we didn't see that as a necessary consequence, it might have been a kind of byproduct of this uh, intervention as well. In order to do so, we used a chimeric uh, Stroop task. And it's really, I put it up here because it's a really fun task. And even adults find it difficult. And you get, um, in it, you get kind of hybrid um, animal bodies, uh, sorry, animal cartoons. In, uh, the animals are made up of a head and a body, and you have to circle um, what, this, what the body of this animal is, okay? So in this case, oh, the body is a duck, you should circle duck, okay? But were you looking at the body or were you looking at the head? That's the real question, because if you come to, the, to this one over here, um, the answer here is actually sheep, because the body is the sheep, but our attention is you know, pulled towards the, the face so much that we have to inhibit the idea that this is a pig um, uh, in order to circle the right answer sheep. So these are fun tests, pen and paper tests that we administered to the whole class um, at the end as well. Okay, so um, just some details of the, the intervention. Um, it was a large scale randomized control tr trial. Um, the pre-intervention levels of performance were assessed by using the ear early years foundation stage profile for each child. So we have a baseline of performance for the children. Um, clearly they were randomly distributed across different groups, but we have some kind of baseline performance for each of them. Um, as I mentioned before, the post tests were the GL assessment tests. We targeted year three and five within England. Um, and in total, 6,672 children from 87 different primary schools uh, took part. So you can see they're spread out all over um, England. Um, we had a fair, you know, a fair number of schools. Um, it was quite fun, actually. We found that, um, well, quite fun for my research assistant <laughs> to do the, uh, the recruitment. Um, and we had lots of help from learners also in contacting schools for, for this. Um, one thing that we found was quite interesting is that schools that were in smaller towns and, and countryside were often much more receptive to participating in this research um, because they sometimes feel a bit left out from research. You know, research takes place in big urban centers and the research centers um, focus on the schools near them and don't go out to the small towns. So the small towns were really keen. That's my tip if you're trying to recruit uh, schools to a study. Um, in our sample, about 30% of the children uh, were eligible for free school meals, which is higher than the national average. Um, and that's quite important because um, it might allow us to assess whether uh, this kind of intervention works differently for children f um, in more difficult backgrounds versus those in kind of traditional uh, average uh, backgrounds. And um, I I'm not going to be talking about this, but um, within our sample of children that were in, in the intervention, we also selected a small subset of these people, of these children, sorry, who um, took part in a much more detailed cognitive battery and scanning to try to tease apart the actual mechanisms of, of, any, of how any academic uh, improvements might have occurred. You may remember the evidence I presented to you at the beginning, which was really the basis for this intervention, was really based on um, university students. So we are making a leap of faith from the basic science to the practice by thinking that similar sorts of principles are going to operate in children um, at that age. Uh, in the younger age group. So it would be nice if we could validate that those principles were actually working with uh, a sample of, of children in the ages that we were um, studying. And finally, uh, as in all Education Endowment um, Foundation funded projects, the, if, um, the, evalu uh, sorry, the um, intervention was evaluated by an independent uh, evaluator, in this case, the NFER, National Federation of Educational Research, um, who were not invested in the outcome uh, in any way. Um, okay, so what was the role of the NFER? Um, they did the kind of random allocation of classes to one uh, to the intervention or the control groups. And I'll give you a little more detail about that in a minute. They delivered the, the assessments, so we weren't in there fiddling the numbers <laughs> or, or anything like that. Um, they also issued online questionnaires to staff from all the schools and did some face-to-face um, kind of interviews with some of the people so we could get some qualitative feedback from the practitioners about what they perceived as working and whether this had transformed their practice in any way and what suggestions they could feed into future developments of it as well. 
Um, we, however, our team uh, delivered the kind of chimeric animal scroop task I mentioned beforehand. Um, Okay, so just to be clear about the kind of design of the randomized control trial, um, and I'm saying this because I think it's, it, it's important to highlight this because I think this particular structure that keeps <laughs> the schools engaged. Um, so randomized control trials, some people have business as usual, some people have the intervention, and as we've said, we have an active control, so some people have the active control. One of the problems with randomizing schools to these conditions is that when the schools are put in the business as usual, they're often disappointed because they get attracted to the trial um, through the big headline of, you know, scientists show that we can improve math and science, and they say, hooray, this will be good for my, for my school, and then they're told at the last minute, actually, you get to do, you don't get it, you get to do the business as usual, right? So this leads schools to drop out. Um, uh, so the design that we went for is one in which, because we had two year groups, is one in which the allocation of conditions was randomized across the year group. So in any particular school, one year group, be it year three or year five, was allocated to the stop and think intervention, and the other year group, um, converse, the converse year group, <laughs> would be allocated to one of the two control conditions. So for example, um, if year three was in one school was in the intervention, then year five might be allocated to business as usual control. Um, or if say year five uh, was in the intervention, then in that school, year three would be allocated to the active control C+. This ensured that this, every school always had at least one year group that uh, was involved in the, um, you know, the intervention that had been advertised. And again, you know, we came to this through discussions with our educational um, practitioners and partners for uh, about you know, what might keep them in a trial and what might make them drop out of a trial. Um, okay, so quick, I'm quickly gonna move on to uh, what the results were. Um, so first of all, uh, just to show a little bit the, the sample size, um, uh, the NFER decided uh, with the Education Endowment Foundation that to evaluate the um, effectiveness of this uh, intervention, they would compare the children in the stop and think um, condition to the combined control groups. In other words, to the children in the business and usual and the active control together. So that means that in their reports, they uh, compare intervention versus combined control. So there's only two groups. We will a little bit later on talk about what happens when you split them up as well. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of the number of children that took part in each group um, and a, a sense of what the attrition rate was overall. So attrition rate, children who started in, in the program and then didn't and then weren't there for the evaluation dropped out. The important thing is that there's no difference between math and science and there's no difference between the intervention and control groups. So any differences we see aren't because um, you know, some schools were hiding the children <laughs> from uh, that, that were in one condition or maybe, you know, one condition made more children sick <laughs> and hence they weren't at school that day or something like that. Same, same amounts. So what were the results here? We have the headline result published in the Education Endowment Foundation reports um, and I'll talk you through it in a little bit more detail. So first of all, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with um, the way the Education Endowment Foundation reports its, um, the findings from its intervention trial. Um, first of all, I'll just focus on this column, um, is their padlock security rating. So this is really how um, reliable they think the trial was, reliably, sorry, the trial was carried out, um, how watertight it was. Um, and we have four padlocks, which is almost as high as you can possibly get. The only way that you could get five padlocks is if you have, um, I believe, less than 10% attrition. Um, but since the national average is 12%, um, it's hard to see how you could possibly get five padlocks. Um, anyway, so for, for, you know, they're very happy with the four padlock uh, thing. Um, what else do they report? They reported the effect size of um, the intervention on academic performance um, in terms uh, in, in, in math and science and grouping together the year five and year three groups. So ignoring the fact that there might be age differences. Um, and essentially what they found is that in maths, uh, children who had taken part in Stop and Think had uh, on average a one month's uh, better progress in performance than those who were in the control condition. Um, and in science, they had two months uh, better performance. Um, and statistically, this was significant for science, but not quite significant for, um, uh, for maths, okay? 
Um, so the other thing to look at is the cost rating. This intervention was incredibly cheap. And I'll give you some details. So um, you know, it was something like seven pounds per pupil. Um, so you know, for seven pounds invested, two months additional um, improvement is really something that um, head teachers should be thinking about quite seriously. Um, so let's look. Let's kind of break this down in a little bit more detail and see exactly what happened. Um, so here we have the the, the data reported in the um, NFER reports. Um, columns, you know, performance. Math year three, math year five, science year three going this way, science year five. These are the numbers we've seen before. These are the effect sizes. Um, and the important thing is they quote effect sizes, but also confidence intervals saying, you know, my real effect is going to be somewhere within this interval. And what we want is for this confidence interval not to include zero. Because if it includes zero, it means that zero is a possible uh, outcome of your intervention, that there might have not been any effect at all. Um, and what we notice, this is exactly what was on the previous slide, is that um, in maths, um, there is uh, an effect size overall um, of 0 0.9. Um, and it, the zero is included in this interval. It's just included in this interval. So it's just not statistically significant. In contrast, in <coughs> science, the effect size is not only bigger, um, but also the zero is not included in this interval, showing, as they had on the slide before, that this is actually a statistically significant um, you know, uh, increase in performance. But the reason I put this up is that we, here we break down performance by year group. And what you notice is that actually these effects are driven by performance in year five alone. Right? So the year five one um, is just about significant in maths and is significant uh, in, in science. Okay? So it seems that this intervention is working best in year five, and that's quite important because it plays into teacher feedback we're going to get, uh, we're going to see in a minute. Um, so we were all also interested as a kind of secondary measure in uh, how this played out in the context of children who were on free school meals. So you know, is this having a differential effect in children from more difficult backgrounds um, than those with uh, less difficult backgrounds, and is that effect you know, better or worse uh, in some ways? And um, what we notice here is that uh, the, for, for children for in, in with free school meals, there are much fewer of them. Um, in uh, maths, year three and year five, um, there are actually quite large effect sizes. The largest effect sizes we saw beforehand, year five was 0.12. Here in maths, year three, the effect size is 0.19, so it's bigger than anything we found before. Okay, uh, and 0.16, but the zero is included in these intervals. So we don't quite have enough evidence to say that these effects are statistically significant. Now, the reason for that is because the trial was underpowered to pick this up. Um, it didn't recruit enough children with fr from free school meals. Um, if we had a larger sample, we may have may been able to make um, you know, stronger conclusions. But it's encouraging because uh, for us who are interested in trying to bridge the gap between low achieving and higher achieving children because it does suggest that actually this is far more effective in the lower achieving children and maybe is something that should be pursued with a larger sample to establish whether that's true or not. Um, and one final um, point about the results. Remember that active control, the C plus, the social interaction? Um, if we want to know whether it's our inhibitory control idea which has come from science, which is really driving the improvement in academic performance, what we need to do is look at the performance of the stop and think children against those children that were playing that social uh, computer game. And this is exactly what's being shown here. Um, so what we've got here is uh, in year five, well actually year three, year five, both year three and year five combined in maths. Year three, year five, both year three and year five combined in maths. Um, and what we see is that we're, we're showing the performance. This is uh, stop it on this column is how much better is stop and think than the children in the active control. Okay, and what we're what we're seeing here is that the children who were in stop and think, their scores were better and significantly better than those um, who were in the the uh, C plus, the active control. Similarly. Science and for maths, the same is true. So the children were better than those in the active control, suggesting that it was indeed inhibitory control that uh, was driving this improvement in performance. Again, to be perfectly honest, what we can see is that this is really driven by the year five pupils, and the year three pupils aren't really showing much of an effect in, in anything. 
This is interesting because it contrasts to what we were seeing with the free school meals. Do you remember just the previous slide? Uh, can I go backwards? Oh, yes. <laughs> the biggest effect size in free school meal children was in year three children. Okay, so some questions being raised here. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the, the results from the trial and then get back to some fundamental questions about the, the lessons. Um, oh, I actually, I've jumped something. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you some of the comments that teachers uh, made about uh, taking part in, in this trial. So, summary of the results. Um, you know, Stop and Think has improved uh, performance on standardized tests, and this is kind of medium or far transfer because they weren't being trained on these tests. They were just being trained on hybrid control, and then they get some kind of quite distant uh, test, uh, pen and paper test, and, and it's improving their performance. Um, it leads to a two-month performance in science um, and a one-month improvement in math. Um, and this, all of the, these gains are based on basically just seven and a half hours input per child at a cost of £5.65 per child. So not much input, substantial gains um, by kind of educational measures. Um, it appears to us that the effects are driven by uh, year five in both math and science. Um, and as I've said before, the, uh, f the improvement was greater than in the active control. So it is inhibitory control that is kind of driving this improvement in performance. Okay, so um, what did the teachers think of all of this? Because at the mo moment, all we've done is use kind of quantitative, pre-registered, predefined quantitative measures of, of performance. Well, here's some examples of quotes taken from the NFER um, report. Um, so, you know, one teacher said, the stop and think game um, the game show, contestants and animation in the program, encouraged pupils to reason more, uh, which enhanced their learning skills. So it improved kind of metacognitive um, abilities. Um, another teacher said, stop and think help pupils to further develop social skills, such as listening, considering other pupils' points of views. You know, social perspective taking is uh, being improved um, here. Some pupils took the stop and think ideas into another lesson. Um, that's to say, pupils were taking time to consider questions before answering. So in fact, the impact was bleeding into other lessons and had much broader impact than, than just um, in math and science. Um, what about their own development? Did this have any impact on, on the teacher's practice, um, professional practice and, and reflection? Um, well, here's what one teacher said. So it allowed me to develop my understanding of how children in my class learn and to analyze what they know, how clearly they understand concepts and to identify misconceptions that some or most role uh, of the children in my class have. So it's some kind of reflection on their own practice and what the children in their class require. And it gave me insights into how children and I uh, children's ideas can change when given thinking time and how they are able to reason um, as to why something is right or wrong. Okay, so here we have a kind of richer uh, uh, output <laughs> that comes out of this rather than just the kind of quantitative performance of changing your score on um, an ach a standardized achievement test. Um, so these are all just pre-registered, um, sorry, blah, blah. so these are all findings that pre-registered quantitative measures uh, do not assess. Okay? So you really have to dig deeper and talk to the teachers, to your colleagues, to find out what the real impact or rather the broader impact of these sorts of interventions um, can be. So further uh, feedback from the teacher, although there were lots of positive comments, <laughs> um, the majority of teachers interviewed did not endorse uh, the rollout of the program in its current form. So why is this the case? Well, there are a number of different reasons. Um, one reason is that teachers argued that, or some of them said that it would be difficult to fit this into uh, the existing school day. And I think this is a resistance to add yet more things into the curriculum, yet more into the program. Um, and, and, and I think this is a slight misunderstanding because these, the stop and thing was supposed to take place within existing math and science timetables. So it wasn't adding additional stuff as well. Um, they didn't like the fact that in our current version, they could not select which content would be displayed. Um, there were some software problems with the program crashing and so forth. Uh, there were some complaints that pupils found it boring. I mean, pupils are used to really high-end, glossy computer games, and we are not high-end, glossy developers. <laughs> um, we are an academic uh, team. So, um, you know, the graphics and so forth seemed a little less engaging. And in fact, we heard this a lot from year five teachers who said, oh, well, the, you know, it was too simple and boring and the kids didn't like it. I like to contrast that against the finding that the year fives are the ones that had the most benefit. Uh, in fact, the only ones that had benefit in this trial. So that's something to keep in mind uh, about when interpreting the comments that are being made by, by teachers and students. Um, okay, so 
That's about it in terms of the intervention. Uh, the full details of the report are can be found on the Education Endowment Foundation uh, websites, and we're currently moving ahead to an efficacy trial, a larger trial, and um, trying to resolve some of these problems in, in the software. So the cycle doesn't end there. The cycle of development and discourse and conversation with practitioners continues as we continue to improve our um, intervention and our understanding of the mechanisms that underlie this intervention. Um, I just want to reflect a little bit on some questions that I think arise from this kind of work. Um, so I may not have the answers to these questions, but um, they, they, they are things that I think you should be thinking about when you're reading uh, reports about intervention results and listening to presentations like this. So there's a fantastic new book on educational neuroscience which has just come out, uh, which is edited by Michael Thomas, uh, myself and uh, Iroise Dumonté, um, which kind of brings together practitioners and uh, basic scientists, educational researchers um, and so forth. And in it is a chapter by Derek Bell in which he kind of takes the um, educator's perspective on these kind of educational neuroscience um, interventions and kind of asks some questions which I think are highly per per pertinent. Um, one question is, you know, how can, you, how can the benefits of personalized learning be maximized within the social context of the school and its environment? What does that mean? That means that we develop these interventions outside the lab, or, or sorry, outside the school, but schools are vastly different, have vastly different cultures, vastly different ways of delivering the curriculum. Um, and we need to take more seriously the differences, the individual differences in the way the schools are delivering their program in order to develop programs, that, uh, yeah, how schools are delivering their curriculum in order to develop programs that, are, that can mesh well with the whole range of um, mechanisms by which the curriculum is being delivered. Um, you know, one key example of that is most schools will have math every day, but what about science? Right. Science for some schools is on a Tuesday, uh, other schools they do it as a topic, two weeks of science and then another two weeks with no science where they're doing history instead and so forth. So very different ways of delivering it. Um, next question is, well, how can uh, research findings inform practice more effectively? The answer to that is to have more dialogue. Um, I think we should have more um, really funded exchanges, funded internships where educational practitioners can come into the labs, into the scientific um, uh, the, the research institutions to really get involved in the dialogue of, of what questions in education need to be addressed. Similarly, uh, basic scientists should have the opportunity to spend some time in a real classroom. You know, three months which, with a bunch of five-year-olds will change the way you think forever. Um, and um, yeah, so these sorts of interactive mechanisms really need to be put in place. Um, to what extent is it ethical to test things out on students? That's a really good question. Um, you know, if you, the same issue arises in, um, in medical research. Um, you know, if we think that something's going to work, then why should we, withhold, we be withholding it from a certain subset of children in uh, control groups? And there are lots of answers to that. Uh, that have come from medicine about staggered designs where you know the control group will get it anyway but just a little bit later and the final question is how can the impact of interventions be maximized and I think this is a really big question because all I've been doing here is talking to you about research how do we get from basic research to practice and now we've evaluated the practice and then what do we just shut up shop and go home really the next step is making sure there's uptake within the classrooms and how do we go from having shown this is effective to making sure that um, classes, teachers actually take this up and actually use it and that it continues to be relevant with changing curricula, um, changing fashions, uh, educational fashions and so forth. So I think a lot more effort needs to be put into going from having established that something works to implementing it in the classes across um, you know, across the country. Um, so, uh, you know, these are my thoughts rather than Derek Bell's thoughts uh, on this. Um, it's great to talk about bi-directional bi dialogues. I think they are, as I hope I've tried to convince you, they're essential to drive this process forward. Um, the question is, how do we make them happen? You know, everyone is so busy. Uh, it's, it's really hard to find time and space for people to get together who come from really different conceptual backgrounds um, and, and kind of talk on the same page. Um, here we have described um, a randomized control trial. Randomized control trials come out of the medical um, 
model of evaluating things, uh, and they have value, um, but they have problems as well. Uh, they, in randomized control trials, there's an assumption that there must be one key factor which is going to lead to the improved behavior, and if you can control out all the others, you prove that this works. But it may in the real world be that there is no single magic bullet, um, that in fact it's an accumulation of small little um, factors that lead to an, a measurable improvement in academic performance. So it may be inhibitory that inhibitory control is um, doing a small part of it, but maybe just bringing the whole class together at the beginning and engaging with the teacher around the idea of reflection is another thing that this stop and think was contributing, uh, what was doing and also contributes to that. And it's the whole thing together, not a single element which is leading to the um, performance enhances. Um, and um, I mean, I, you know, the idea that one size fits all does not work. So even if something works in a randomized control trial or doesn't work in it, it may work in a subset of the schools who have a particular um, practice that resonates well with this particular intervention. Um, it's hard to know what counts as a success. Here, success is evaluated against performance on standardized tests. But is that what you want? And I guess that, the answer to that question depends on who you are. It might be what central government wants. Um, um, uh, is it what the individual teacher wants, uh, or the parents, or the children themselves? Um, and uh, I think just the last thought is, is the idea that we have to always keep improving, always keep moving forward. So we've developed this game, Stop and Think, through a particular computerized platform. It's been shown to be effective, um, but things change. The world change. Computers are, I hate to say this, on their way out. Um, most children will now be using tablets or, or phones or um, things up in, in the cloud and so forth. And so we have to be able to renew our intervention to find a medium for delivering that intervention which keeps pace with what is happening in the real world. Similarly, the curriculum changes, what, is, what counts as um, uh, effective performance changes and so forth. So even if you have something that was based in science that is shown to work at this time slot, uh, th this time point, you have to keep pushing it forward, pushing the envelope to keep up with the changing world and make sure it remains um, relevant uh, to the current climate. Okay, so even if there are lots of challenges, we should not give up. There's, that's my bottom line here. Um, right, so I just want to say all this work, this was a very large project. I'm not the only one that was involved in it. I had many, many colleagues who contributed to it. Uh, it was funded by the Wellcome Trust and the Education Endowment Foundation. Um, and we had partners from Birkbeck, University of London, the UCL Institute of Education, Learnis, who's hosting this, this annual lecture, um, and also the Centre for Educational Neuroscience um, uh, was involved in this. So thank you very much. Uh, it was a pleasure and I hope you enjoyed um, listening to me. Thank you.